Sort of here, 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 and everything. Good morning. Good morning. All right. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. All right. That's good. How do you like these chippery mornings here lately? I love it. <laughs> good deal. Well, it's good to see you here this morning, and we're happy to have each and every one of you. If you're a visitor with us today, we thank you for coming. There's a card in the back of the pew. Please fill it out. Put it in the offering plate when it comes through so we can get to know you a little bit and just make a simple contact with you. If you're visiting with us on the, on the internet here today, we're excited to have you too. And uh, just uh, give us a little shout out there, a comment, let us know that you're there and everything. We appreciate it very much. Our flowers today are given in love and sweet memories of Howard Champion by his wife Barbara Champion and his children Joe Champion, Susan Denton, Allison Carswell. Uh, beautiful flowers, beautiful flowers. It's sort of the fall the fall color scheme there. I know that because my wife makes me put out flowers. And so, so I, I get, I, I'm that smart. She just tells me what to put and where to put it, and that's what I do. Color coordination, I don't have any choice on that. But anyway, good to have you here today. And so let's just uh, turn to your neighbor and say, Happy Fall. Happy fall. That's right. Couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> but, uh, our, our this Bible study this morning in one of the Sunday school classes that I done was uh, that God loves you, and if you do, if you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God, right? If you don't love your neighbor, then you don't love God. And so uh, I hope you keep that in mind as you go about this season in our life here in this church, and we're growing here, and we're great to have all these new members here and everything. So we thank you for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, we do thank you again that you bless us, Father, and that you do love us, Lord, even though we fail you so many times in so many ways, Father. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son Jesus, who died on the cross for my sins, Father, and everyone else in this room's sin, Lord. We thank you for that. We can't match that love, Father, but we can certainly give you all we got, Father, and show it by loving others around us, Father. We thank you now, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen together. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. the 
stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and he's fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lamb. Again, I've said this before, a hand clap is nice, an unenthusiastic hand clap is very depressing. <laughs> so, I believe that the Psalms tell us to clap our hands to the Lord, and I'm all for it. But when we do it, let's do it as if unto the Lord and not unto man. So let's clap our hands to God. Now let's sing a song unto the Lord and not unto man. Send the light. Switch on to the first verse there, Silas. Two more slides. There's a call come drinking o'er the restless waves in the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. In the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light. may be seated. Aren't you excited to be able to give to the Lord this morning? Amen. Let's give cheerfully. Uh, if you're online at home watching right now, you can go to www.oakgrovekm.com and there is a link at the top of the page to give. If you are here in person, uh, we're going to pass the plates around here in a minute. If you'll get their attention, you can give in that way. Or you can drop it in a plate before or after the service. But we give because God gave so much to us. Because he is good all the time. And all the time, there you go. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we're so thankful. Thankful that you're in control. Thankful that, that all the confusion and things that might scare us or concern us that are going on all around us all the time don't confuse or scare you. You are still God. You are still the king on your throne. And we trust in you. Thank you that we can have that rest, that your finished work on the cross 
uh, gave us the opportunity to rest in you. Lord, let us give this morning with cheerful hearts. Take this offering, multiply it, and spread it around the world that your word might be heard and that your kingdom would be built. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. Good, Good morning. So, filling in for Hannah today with our family moment. Let me start with our scripture to start out with. Matthew 23, <clears throat> verse 25. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. I'm starting encouraging, right? You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also be clean. What, when you wake up in the morning, what do you spend more time doing? Cleaning up the outside? Do you wash your face? Do you take a shower? Do you brush your hair? Do you brush your teeth? I hope the answer to all that is yes, by the way. Um, <laughs> You spend time getting ready. Maybe it's even just pull back a quick ponytail for us girls and run out the door. But I'm pretty sure majority of the time you don't jump out of bed and just run out the door in your pajamas. Barefoot, teeth not brushed, hair crazy. We'd all feel a little embarrassed to do that. We clean up our outsides. But when you get up in the morning, what do you do to your inside? Did you do anything to prepare the inside of you for the day? That usually comes later in the day. We were talking in Sunday school today about how we got in the middle of a work day and got into a bind, and so we thought we better talk to God, but that was the first time we'd touch base with him all day. We were busy getting the outside ready. Then it goes on to verse 28. I'm going to jump down one. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, we're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So if I went to a birthday party and I walked in, I even had a kid or two stop me today and they're like, is this your birthday? I'm like, no, I just get to carry around the fun gift. But just carrying the gift around, I drew a little bit of attention from some people sitting around me. I had two or three people ask me, what's in the bag? Do you have a present? It drew attention because it says happy birthday and it's got a sparkly tag and it's pretty. And if you've ever thrown a birthday party, you do kind of eye when the kid walks in or your friend walks in with a gift. You can't help but eye the gift. We've all done it. At Christmas, what do you look for under the tree? Did you ever count the presents? Make sure your sibling had the same number you had. We checked the sizes. The outside mattered to us. But if I gave someone this present, which looks very exciting, and then there was a box in there. Yes. And then I opened the box. 
but out came a bunch of tissues and trash. I think as a kid getting a present, I'd feel a little bit disappointed with what was inside my box. So it sure looked good on the inside. Or I could offer you an apple, but then when I turn around and I see it's half eaten and kind of been dug out in the middle. I know my kids in my house would not be impressed and want to eat this apple because it was starting to brown also. And they would put that off to the side, even though one side of it looked pretty shiny. So there's all kinds of things in our life and our day-to-day -day that they look really good. The friends, they might look really popular. They might have the cooler clothes. Or the car we drive as we get older matters, or we want people to think it matters. But we all know what really counts on the inside. So my question to you, or my challenge, I should say to you, is tomorrow morning when you wake up and your alarm goes off, whether you're late and you need to fly out the door, or whether you want to hit snooze three more times, that would be me. I challenge you to stop, and before you clean up the outside, what can you do to clean out your inside and get your day started? First, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and the outside also will be clean. Let's start our day with a prayer, with a moment with God, with a devotion, whatever that looks like between you and God. Let's start our day, and I think we're going to look a whole lot prettier and a whole lot more sparkly the rest of the day. Pray with me. Father God, forgive me for the days that I, I rush out. There's lunches to be made. There's kids to get in the car. There's work to be done. There's deadlines to meet. There's appointments. There's practices. There's friends to gather with. There's meals to be prepared. Lord, the list goes on and on. But you tell us, God, to clean the inside first. God, may we all be convicted at some point during this week to stop and just say, Lord, I'm going to need you today. God, go with me. Go with me down the school hallways. Go with me to my soccer practice. Go with me on this trip. And may I hear your voice. And may we even go so far as to read your word and hear what you want to say to us, God. Help us to clean the inside first and trust you to allow the outside to be cleaned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Jesus to Calvary did go. His love for sinners to show what he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you! Oh, how he loves me! Oh, how he. Sing that first verse one last time. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves you and me? I don't know about you, sometimes uh, I think the world just needs to know and the people in it that they're loved. Some of us go a week, a month, without somebody just saying, hey, I love you. And that's uh, that's kind of overwhelming. But no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, how, how, how imperfect you are inside and out, knowing that you're loved by your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so much so that he died for your sins and my sins, that's got to give us a little extra beat in our step, knowing that we're loved and cared about, especially when the world is kind of crazy. Think on that as we go to the Lord in prayer. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much that you are the example of love. And before we think that a list of good things here and there kind of gets on our checkbox, checklist that kind of earns our way where we need to go in our relationship with you, your word is quite, quite clear that it starts and ends with love. Help us to love like you, Christ. Help us to be so attentive to where you would have us show kindness and say a word of encouragement and be a mentor or allow ourselves to be mentored, to be encouraged, and just be available to tell someone that they are loved. And that love comes from you. Thank you for allowing to assemble, uh, be here, and, and worship as part of the body of Christ. Whether we're in person or online, we just continue to lift up our praise of you, Lord. Your name and your alone. And just ask that you are glorified. Thank you for loving us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to see you this morning in God's house. Hope everyone has had a great week. And now we're starting off the first of our week here in God's house. Great, great to see you all. If you've got your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 5. James 1, verse 5. And as you see on the screens, I've entitled my message, When Finding the Way. When Finding the Way. 
As you're turning over there, I want to give a, a special shout out to all of our nursery workers that in Sunday school and during preaching make that ministry available to those that choose to use it. This is a family-friendly service, and it always will be, but I just want to say a special shout out to those folks that are in the nursery during those times. We appreciate that ministry so much. James 1 verse 5, again, reading from God's Word. Here is God's Word. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Again, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Father, as we attempt to look at your word this morning, I realize that I might be distracted. Some of our folks in here might be distracted. Maybe we've had a full week, got a lot of stuff on the mind. But right now, you've provided a divine appointment, a meeting with each individual in this place, in this space. And Lord, you want our attention, so I pray that you will tie up that roaring lion, the devil that wants to devour us. I pray that you will seize our minds, our hearts, and our souls, that our attention will be solely on you. And that the words that come out of my mouth would not be my words, but rather yours. That I would add nothing to the scriptures, but only your truth be told, and that you and you alone are glorified. I pray even right now, your stirring hearts, decisions will be made. Hearts rededicated to you. Decisions made as far as where you're going to take them moving forward in their walk with you. And I again pray that your word will not return null and void. That it will speak loud and clear. Change us. Mold us into your image. Receive all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you get lost? Lost a lot? How good are you at finding your way around new spaces and new places? And better yet, when you do get off track, are you willing to stop and get directions, or do you just keep on going till you find a destination? I didn't say the destination. I said a destination. Years ago, and I may have told this story, so if you heard it before, sorry. Anyway, I lived in Hickory. And Hickory is one of the worst places in the world to get lost. Every avenue, drive, and road, they all have similar uh, names, at least they do to me. I got so bad at getting lost in Hickory that the youth that I was serving at the time, they gave me a nickname. And that nickname was U-Turn. I got a T-shirt and everything. U-Turn. Nothing like getting labeled uh, with that kind of, you know, nickname. I don't, I don't, I don't recommend that. But anyway... I used to think I was someone that was decent at directions. I, when I got my map, when I was 16, my father showed me how to do everything with the grids, and I felt good about east, west, north, south, going where I was going, and finding those little idiosyncrasies, those little back roads, back trails, and I felt pretty good about it because I was good at reading that map. But in the great googly moogly map stage that we're in right now, you know, technology, everybody's got a map, everybody's got an app, it seems like the more apps, the more ways you can stream to get to places, the more lost I get. Because I'm too busy recalculating and trying to figure out, is that lady or that guy, that voice that comes out and goes, turn right in the next .2 miles. Is it the first right or is it the second right? Anybody got it? Can I get a witness? All right, there's at least three people that are honest, four in this building right now. But... So many times, again, the road signs don't seem to match what's streaming on the screen. And it caused me to start screaming because I want to know where I'm going. Finding a reliable source of directions is so important. And I would argue that finding a reliable source for truth, right and wrong, is more important. In the day and age that we live in, too often believers and non-believers waste a lot of time getting directions and wisdom from resources that are too often unreliable, not truthful, and consistently out of touch. And knowing that there is an absolute truth 
absolutely found in the person of Jesus Christ as our source for right and wrong, for our source for wisdom and discernment. That's important to me as a believer in Christ. Is it to you? Amen? We need, oh, that was weak. Back to the clap. We need to make sure, I don't know about you, my right and wrong being found in Christ should be important to me. Amen? Amen. There it is. Because if we're too busy finding another source for that right and wrong, guess what? We're going to find it. And we're going to get lost. And we're going to get nicknames called U-Turn. And we're going to wonder, how did I get here? How did I get here? Well, this morning, we're going to start a new study in the book of James. All right? And as we strive to live out and maintain God's direction, God's direction for our lives, we're going to identify some mile markers, some, some checkpoints that we should see on our journey through faith that shows that we're following God's wisdom versus our own. So hopefully this will be a study that's worth our time and, and as we grow in Christ. Um, give you a little backdrop, background of the book of James. You know, when you think about the book of James, there's a lot of Jameses in the Bible. Which James are we talking about? Are we talking about James, the son of Zebedee? Are we talking about James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the, uh, the original disciples, Mark 2, 14? Are we talking about James, known as Judas, the son of James, or Thaddeus? That's another original disciple. And his name was changed because, or at least had a different name, because how would you like your name be Judas? And the Judas we usually think of as who? Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ. I'd be looking to change my name, too, if that was the case as well. We're not talking about that, James. When we think about the author, the human earthly person given credit through the Holy Spirit, penning this book, actually we're talking about James, the brother of the Lord. And a lot of biblical scholars, a lot smarter folks than me, have come to that deduction through, through study. And if you look and see, um, when we think about James, the brother of Jesus, the earthly brother of Jesus, we know that Jesus had siblings. Matthew 13, verses 55 through 56. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And, and, and James is given, the brother of Jesus, is given credit for this particular book being penned. Um, he, being James, appeared to... Uh, was appeared to by Jesus after the resurrection. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He was a leader of the church himself in Jerusalem. He was a pillar of the faith, Galatians 2, 9 says. And he was a friend of the Apostle Paul in ministry, Acts chapter 21. He has given credit to a lot of scholars, again, for a lot of different things. And he was also believed to have been martyred for the faith in 62 AD. But James faced a dilemma that all of us do as well. And imagine how hard it had to be for James, the earthly brother of Jesus, to invite Jesus Christ, his brother, to be his Lord and Savior. Chew on that for a second or two. Here is a person that raised in the same family, dynamic, and yet Jesus was the Son of God. And James had to, along with his own family, had to come to a conclusion of who Jesus Christ was and wasn't. That's what the world's question is today as well. What are you going to do with Jesus? Is he who he says he was? Or was he a liar? Everyone has to make a decision when it comes to Jesus, including Jesus' brother James. Again, originally written to Christian Jews outside of Palestine. It was believed to be written around 40 to 40 to 60 A.D., um, all those Jewish Christians at that time, they had problems like we have problems, right? Personally and corporately, had stuff going on. They were impatient at times. We can become impatient at times. Um, they catered to different groups. Uh, sometimes the, the book of James points out that they oftentimes catered to the rich. Some folks were robbed by the rich. They strayed away from the truth, James chapter 2, verse 14. They had to get some reminders about controlling their tongue, James 3.1. No one's ever had a, a problem where they had to be reminded to control their tongue, have they? Anybody? This week, last night, Friday or Saturday? Again, thank you for the one person that's honest with that. Um, you know, there's issues similar that we face in the church, problems that, that we could have say has commonality there. And if there was a theme that I would give James, uh, and a lot of folks would chime in and agree with me, the theme of James is 
spiritual maturity. Growing up, growing up in the faith, being mature, going through that process of sanctification involving transforming our old lives into the new lives who we are in Christ. And that's an ongoing process. We're constantly under construction. We're talking about directions a few minutes ago. When you see those, those barrels and those, all those lights shining and deter here and deter there, and I know it's detour. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of construction on those roads. But we in the faith, we're under construction, constantly growing, failing, getting up, Holy Spirit guiding us, growing. That's the deal. That's the, that's the drill. And as we look at God's Word, as He helps us, He's teaching us how to grow in our faith. Now, as we dive into this particular part of James chapter 1, just going to give you a short little recap of what's going on. All right? James, again, he's addressing um, the Jewish Christians and, and is trying to give them a means of encouragement, trying to you know, point them in the right direction, trying to encourage them. It's always great to have someone encourage us in our faith, isn't it? Just to kind of, kind of prod us on and, and not with the electric, uh, one of those cattle prod kind of prodding. Sometimes we, some of us need this because we're so stubborn. We do need a good little jolt once in a while. That, but it, it, James is trying to encourage folks. And, and he, he, he considers it, he says, to remind all those, those folks that are early in their faith, hey, consider it pure joy in facing trials, that is, temptations and tests that come our way. Consider it pure joy, chara in the Greek, Inner gladness based on spiritual realities. Pure joy when you face trials. I'm facing a trial. I should take pure joy in knowing that my God is with me. I shouldn't look at it as, oh, this is an opportunity for God not to show up. Oh, these problems are going to overtake me, overwhelm me, destroy me. <coughs> I'm going to be so frustrated. I'm going to get caught up. It's going to bring me down. No, God is there He's at the crosswalk. He's at the crossings of your life. And he's there. He's going to be with you. And those sufferings that you're facing, God is going to use that to discipline and encourage you. Now, that's easy for me to say on a Sunday morning at 1130, 1140, and everybody would go, amen. But when we're in the middle of it, we don't want to hear none of it. When we're going through that trial, we're like, this is not pure joy. It's pure something else. But God is there, and as James is being used by the Holy Spirit to encourage these believers, say, hey, God's at work. Don't forget that. <clears throat> this testing of your faith, it develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work. Why does it have to finish its work? I don't, I don't want to have to continue to go through this. Some of us are continuing to need to go the maturing process. We've been on milk so long. We've had so many milk shakes, milk duds, milk everything that we don't even know what meat tastes like. And the meat that's going to come from going through these difficult struggles is going to build perseverance in our faith that it's going to cause us to grow that we go off of eating off of milk. See, Austin here enjoys drinking milk. It's appropriate for his age. But some of us spiritually have been followers of Christ for 50 and 60 years, and we're still on the bottle. And we wonder why, well, the Lord's not showing himself to us, because we're on a milk bottle. We're continuing to ask him, Lord, feed me, feed me, feed me. But I don't want to go through anything, amen. Is that how your faith is, if we're honest? Oh, I believe in you, Lord, until you cause me to have to change. Until I get uncomfortable. And when I get uncomfortable... Really, instead of viewing that as a, a hindrance and a pain, we should say, uh-oh, the Lord's going to grow me. I'm going to go through some perseverance. I'm going to go through some trials. I'm going to go through some testings. And I may not know how to handle those things, but if I lack wisdom, James 1.5, I need to ask God for it. I need to ask him, Lord, I don't have a clue. I don't know how to clue how to raise my kids or my grandkids. I don't know how to kick my, my son-in-law out of the house. <laughs> I added that one for free. Anyway, I don't know where to go where you're leading. 
But Lord, I can trust that if I lack the wisdom to understand what to do, Sophia, wisdom, discernment on various matters, I lack the spiritual intelligence, the spiritual wherewithal. I need your supreme intelligence. I don't need this, this, this diet intelligence. I don't need this less there than thou wisdom. I don't need the tab of soda. Remember tab? Y'all remember tab? That drink in the 80s that had one calorie, that tasted like, like milked cardboard, okay? It was a terrible drink. Sorry, tab people. And, and that's not what we need to drink from today. I want me a kicking chicken, RC Cola, 240 calorie, kick me on my backside soda when I'm drinking a soda. Anybody get a witness here? I want something that's going to fill me up. And I need to quit living off the milk, and I need to get to the meat. And if I lack wisdom, Lord Jesus, I need you to help me because I don't have a clue. Anyone lacks wisdom, we can ask for it. And that's a problem too, isn't it? We have to ask. Most of us don't want to ask for nothing. I ain't going to ask for nothing. Look at me. I can do life all by myself. I don't need any help. I'll just pull up my bootstraps and you watch me do it, all right? And we do, right? And then who's in the, uh, in the bloody mess that's left behind you, right? Doing it by yourself. I get it. I respect it even to a point. That point being when we continue to press on and press on and we leave everyone in our wake and God's like, just call on me. I'll give you that wisdom. But see, there's a condition of that wisdom in verses 6 and 7. In receiving that wisdom, he or she must not doubt. Those who doubt are like waves in the sea, blowing and tossing like the wind. We shouldn't think man will receive anything if we don't trust God. When we don't trust God, we become double-minded. We're double agents. It's like we're two different people. Well, I'm going to act like the, the follower of Christ on Sunday, and everyone's going to go, there goes an awesome Christian. Yes, I am. And I'm going to do everything that the Lord tells me to do on Sunday from 11 to 12. And when people are watching, I'm going to act like I'm following the Lord. Some of us play these games. And you were talking about, Krista, earlier about the outside versus the inside. And we're so busy trying to impress everybody. Oh, I'm tough. I can handle it. That God is saying, in your weakness, I am strong. When you can't see, I can see. Why don't you just trust me with it? And we shouldn't expect any blessing. We shouldn't respect any wisdom when we doubt the Lord. Now, I'll be the first one to admit there's been some doubting moments. Anybody ever read about Doubting Thomas? Man, what a terrible nickname for him, right? I would call it Honest Thomas because honestly, he didn't believe what was going on and he needed to see something in it, didn't he? And some of us need to see God in action. And the only way that we're going to take some doubt out of our souls is to ask the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. We can't do it on our best thinking. We can't just do it because we want to. We have to ask the Lord as we're traveling our way, as we're trying to do our life, as we're trying to, to follow Christ, there's going to be some times that we are going to doubt. And that's when God's got to show up majorly in our lives. We have to be honest with him. We have to cry out to him. Say, Lord, I don't feel like worshiping you today. Lord, I don't feel like following you today. Lord, I'm, I'm miserable. I'm hitting the floor. My, my face planted. I, I'm struggling I don't feel you, Lord, but I praise you anyway. I, I still call out you. I ask my, for wisdom. I ask for your guiding hand. I ask to feel your love. Lord, show your grace and mercy on me today. Oh, my goodness. I can't help but think the Lord's going to pour out blessing and blessing after you over and over on top of you. And in that moment, you may not feel it, but it's coming when we're honest with God. But we can't doubt and when we do that, we confess that sin and we turn it over to God. And we say, Lord, take my pride. Take, take everything. And just as you humble me, may I receive your blessing. And when I feel like you're far away, you remind me that you're close. It says in verse 12, Blessed, 
that is more than happy, it's spiritual joy. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Trial, those temptations, trial, those tests. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Had an opportunity to talk to someone this week about eternal life, the crown of life, that gift that Jesus and he alone gives. When you and I persevere, we should know there's going to be a gift given that God himself is going to provide to us. He's going to lay a crown at our feet. And the beautiful thing is, is when we put that crown on, we're going to take it right back off and place it back as if he, because the only reason we have hope, the only reason we ever receive a crown or any jewel in our crown is because of Jesus Christ. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only reason that we can persevere. And y'all faced a lot of stuff. We could have testimony hour, and I guarantee we could fill it up. And we didn't necessarily want to sign up for that perseverance, but God has continued to be faithful. He's there. He's with us. And those that follow God's direction, we've been reborn, haven't we? Because in John 3, 3, I believe that anybody wants to experience the kingdom of God, anybody wants to find the realization of heaven, we have to be born again. We have to say, you know what, my old self, I'm going to turn that over to God. I'm going to admit that I'm a sinner. I'm going to believe with my heart. I'm going to confess with my tongue, believe in my heart, and I'm going to invite Christ to be Lord and Savior in my life. When we do that, we find the way. We find the direction. And God is going to continue to work on us in construction so that we gain that wisdom, we gain that direction, and he shows us that way and we're able to follow. So, as we introduce part of the book of James, as we look at the first 12 verses, what can we take from it this morning? What checkpoints, what benchmarks, what landmarks, as we travel in our path to the Lord, can we be looking for that we make sure that as we're traveling, we see these benchmarks of wisdom in our lives. We want to be able to look as we're driving, see some checkpoints to say, okay, we're heading in the right direction. We want to make sure that, yes, we're following God's wisdom and not our wisdom. We're heading in the right direction. What checkpoints should we see as followers of Christ? Three of them I want to point to you, and then I'm going to get you out of here. All right? Checkpoints and mile markers that we pursue God's wisdom is. Number one, <coughs> excuse me, be reconciled to the will of God. Be reconciled to the will of God. So many times, we will not reconcile ourselves to the will of God. Sickness will come. Accidents will happen. Disappointments will occur. Tragedies will happen. And we need to remind ourselves to consider it pure joy, my brothers. Verse 2. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. We need to embrace and reconcile to God's will versus our will. In the scriptures, in the King James Version, it says, consider it pure joy. Well, it says all joy. Everything, all joy when we face these trials and we face these testings and temptations. We need to evaluate our struggles. We need to recognize in light of God's sacrifice, love, and grace we need to reconcile that, hey, I'm going to follow God's perfect will. And he was the perfect example to us. You remember that night in the garden when Jesus was preparing for a time when he would be carried off and illegally tried for a, a crime he didn't commit. And he, and he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. And, 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 and he says to the Lord, he says, you know, if you can take this cup from me, whew, I'd appreciate it. But you know what? Yet not my will, but your will be done. During the trials that you're facing right now, can you honestly say, can I honestly say, Lord, yet but not my will be done, your will be done. Talk about drinking from, going from milk to eating from meat. You're changing when you and I can look at that trial, where you can look at that loss, and you look at that painful situation and say, and yet, Lord, not my will, but your wills be done. And that's when you and I reconcile to the will of God. We say, you know what? No longer my will. 
I'm no longer my own. I belong to you, Lord, and I'm submitting and turning it all over to you. When you see that landmark as you're traveling in your faith, when you see that mile marker where you're stop giving your will all the credit and start giving, giving God's will what you follow, you're going from milk to meat. Continuing on, as we look at the second thing, checkpoints are mile markers for wisdom. Not only do we reconcile our will to God, we embrace the testings of our faith. We embrace the testings of our faith. When you look at verse 3 in James chapter 1, it reminds us, if I can see because my eyes are getting so bad, <coughs> because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Embracing the testing of your faith. There's going to be testing. James Vern McGee, I don't know if you guys remember him. Uh, James Vern, he used to say this, Trials and meaningless are meaningless, excuse me. Trials are meaningless, suffering senseless, testing irrational, unless there's some purpose in them. There's some reason that you went through that divorce. There's some reason you went through that medical condition. There's some reason you filed chapter 13 for the third time. There's some reason that you could not find satisfaction in the things of this world, and yet you and God are still having a conversation. There are reasons that we go through what we go through. God is saying embrace that testing. Because why? Romans 8.28 makes it simple. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Testing works for the believer. It isn't against the believer. Trials work for the believer. It's not against them. Just as God called Abraham by faith, just as He tested Joseph, Moses, Job, and David, we can know at 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but what God, excuse me, you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but within the temptation will provide the way to escape so that you'll be able to endure it. Embrace the testing that comes your way. When you and I are traveling our walk of faith, we should see that mile marker. We should see that checkpoint of wisdom. We're reconciling to God's will. We're embracing the testing of our faith. And then the last one. Did I push that? There you go. Remember, have a heart filled with wisdom. Have a heart filled with wisdom. What did James 1.5 say? If you lack wisdom, you're supposed to what? Ask for it. Lord Jesus, I don't know what I'm doing. Will you guide me? Will you fill me with your wisdom? Amen. What a simple prayer. But we have to ask. We have to be willing to humble ourselves. We don't, can't allow ourselves to become double-minded. Double-minded is when we're two different people. One minute we're following God, one minute we're going, eh, if it feels good, I'm going to do what I want to do. We can't be like that. We have to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Verse 19. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo! We need to keep a tight rein on our tongues, verse 26. And we need to keep oneself from being polluted by this world. There's so many things in this world today that are trying to pollute you and I. So many things that are trying to take us away from God's will. And those detours that we see in life, it's important that we keep our eyes on the prize. And we think there's this way, or if we think it's that way, we have to ask God, Lord, I need your wisdom. I need you to fill my heart so that I will know where to go and what to do. And when I get off track, because you're going to get off track, aren't you? You're going to fail. You're going to fall short. But isn't it wonderful that God's already got the calculations? He already knows where to get you back on the right road. You don't have to wonder, is this road going to run out? He's going to put you on the right path. When you don't know which way to go, when you feel like there's no way home, God is there. To show you that right way. Final thought. Are God's checkpoints of discernment obvious in your life? The road you're passing. The path you're taking. Do you see God's wisdom in your path? 
Or do you see yourself taking every road under the sun for right and wrong and truth? That's a tough question. But God wants his children to feel confident in the directions that he's taken. When we yield to God's will, we embrace his testings and we allow our hearts to be filled with his spirit, we can be confident confident in the directions we're taking. Now, in a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of reflection, and it's just as I am. And I would be remiss to think that some of us right now in this building, we, we came in and we're just as we are. But here's the beautiful thing. God doesn't leave you the way he finds you. Some of us have been going on the wrong direction for some time, haven't we? And we've been taking exit after exit, and they've been recalculating after recalculating. And we just seem to be spinning in circles. But God wants to get you in the right path right now. He wants, you, he wants to show you the way home. But you've got to be willing to ask. You've got to be willing to say, Lord, I need your help. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the discernment. I've been living off milk so long. I don't even know what meat tastes like. But I want more of you. Are you willing, believer? Are you willing, follower of Christ, to ask him for that wisdom? And for a non-believer out here, that you've been following the world and you've been trying to fill your life up with every, you know, those restaurants on those exits. Man, those fast food restaurants are awful good, aren't they? But you've been eating that fast food restaurant over and over again, taking those exits, and you're still not full. You're still looking for something to fill your heart, to fill your soul. And the next high, it and the next buzz, it and taken. The next thing that you're experiencing isn't enough. Will you try on God? Will you give him a chance? Will you invite him to be the Lord of your life? Will you admit, hey, I got no clue where I'm going, Lord, but I need your help. And I believe you're the way and the truth and the life. God will listen to you. He's listening to you right now. The question is, are you listening to him and following his direction? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to look at the book of James as we start this study. And think about wisdom and finding the way home, finding our way to you. And Lord, forgive us when we do get off track. And if if there's some decisions that need to be made this morning, I pray that whether it's someone sharing how you have changed their heart and, and making that known to everyone, whether it's reminding someone that this needs to rededicate themselves to you, whether it's just just wanting to worship you and thanking you that you accepted us as we are. And you're molding us even now, shaping us into your image. Oh God, that you would use us. And that when we fall, when we fail, will you put us back on the right path? We need your wisdom. We need your love. We need your grace. We need your forgiveness. We need your assurance that we're going in the right direction. Will you guide us? All these decisions, all these public and private things that we'll all do in our hearts, Lord. I just pray that you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.
And I'm going to ask Miss Krista and Alexa and Silas, we'd like for you to come down and join us. So while they're coming, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And I hope that you've been blessed by having Jason and his family here. And we know that without the support of the... <laughs> yeah. But without the support of a family... You know, a pastor can't be as nearly as effective. So I hope and pray that this month you are going to take the time to show your appreciation and your love for, for Jason and, and the family. And I know Madison's not here with us, but you can say that prayer for her too. But as a token of the church's appreciation, and, and we want to give you this. And um, it's not a pension, is it? No, sir. <laughs> That's a little gas money to go see uh, Madison. <laughs> but I do ask that if you would uh, lift, lift Jason and the family up in prayer this month and verbally come by, give, give them a, a hand of fr uh, friendship, of appreciation, and say whatever you want to. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, he don't follow directions well. <laughs> All right. Got a couple of things that I'll we'll point out to you right quick. In the middle of your bulletin on the inside, there's about five opportunities for you to be a part of our community circle group. If you want to, you know, our, our mission is to know, to grow, and to go.